Good morning and welcome, at least virtually, to the Center for Constitutional Studies at Utah Valley University in Orem, Utah. I'm Scott Paul. I serve here in the center as interim director. Speaking on behalf of my colleagues, we are thrilled to spend two days with you reflecting on the Mayflower and the 400th anniversary of her momentous voyage. Please allow me a few words of introduction and acknowledgement. Organized in 2011, the Center for Constitutional Studies is a nonpartisan academic institute that promotes the instruction, study, and research of constitutionalism. Our mission is to increase constitutional literacy in our local, state, and national communities. We pursue this mission in a multidisciplinary fashion to more effectively equip a new generation of citizens and leaders with the broad understanding that is critical to the perpetuation of constitutional government, ordered liberty, and the rule of law. Speaking on behalf of my colleagues, I express gratitude to UVU Provost, Dr. Wayne Vaught, and UVU President, Dr. Astrid Tuminez, for their support of our center. I also thank the members of our advisory board for their invaluable guidance. Specific to this conference, I must acknowledge two key contributors. First and foremost, Dr. Andy Bibby, who serves as Associate Director of the Center. We'll say more about Dr. Bibby in our next session. So for now, I'll just point out that we have him to thank him and his enthusiasm to thank for all things Mayflower, uh, to thank for this conference. He presented the idea of this conference to us last year, and he's been a driving force behind it ever since. I must also recognize Carrie Dennis, our events and marketing manager. Carrie joined the center at the height of the COVID pandemic and was almost immediately tasked with our first ever virtual conference, which meant, of course, she had no blueprint to follow uh, as she moved forward. Perhaps my biggest regret of this virtual format is that you won't have the pleasure of being on campus to interact with our amazing students here at the center. Thanks to the generous support of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Utah Federalism Commission, and especially the Wood family, nearly 20 incredible student research assistants call the center a home away from home. Simply put, this center is nothing without them. I must make one final acknowledgement at the beginning of this conference. Seven weeks ago, our dear friend and director, Dr. Rodney K. Smith passed away following an eight year battle with cancer. Rod was a gifted leader and a brilliant scholar who exuded genuine affection for everyone he met. We miss him very much. This conference was one of his final projects. So we, we will be especially mindful of him in these two days. We've included on the web page of this conference a link to the center's tribute to Rod. I invite you to learn a little more about him. Finally, any information you'll need for navigating this conference is found on the web page, uh, the, the link that you use to get to the conference. Uh, should anything arise with technical issues, look to the look to the web page for instructions on what to do. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of this session. Grace Mallon is a doctoral candidate in history at the University of Oxford. Her research focuses on state-federal relations in the early American Republic. She's been published several times in the Washington Post. She's the co-founder of the Early American Republic Seminar, or OXIRS, which is based at the Rothermere American Institute at Oxford. Without further ado, Grace. Thank you so much, Scott, um, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this incredible conference. I'm very pleased to be moderating our first panel, um, which is named Pilgrims, Faith and Family. And I'm going to introduce both of our distinguished speakers um, before uh, they get started. So our first speaker um, will be Dr. Polly Hart. Um, from the University of East Anglia, and her um, paper will be entitled The Pilgrims on Innovation. Um, and Dr. Ha is a Yale and Cambridge educated historian of early modern uh, England, and particularly political, uh, sorry, religious uh, thought. And her first book, I believe, is on English Presbyterianism. Um, and she has another book uh, coming out soon, um, 
which explains how freedom as independence universalized classical notions of liberty across the social and gender hierarchies in the English Revolution. So we can all look forward to that. Our second speaker is Rebecca Fraser, who will be speaking on 17th century women and the Mayflower. Um, and um, Rebecca Fraser is a professional writer, journalist, and broadcaster. Her first book was on Charlotte Bronte, but she's branched out from the Brontes. Um, she published a book called The Story of Britain, A Popular History of the United Kingdom, and also um, The Mayflower, The Families, The Voyage and the Founding of America, which is a portrait of two generations of a European family in Plymouth Colony. Um, I'm sure you'll want to know more about our speakers. So please do go to the website for their full bios. Um, but without further ado, um, Dr. Ha, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Grace. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, everyone at UVU for putting together such a rich program. It is a tremendous joy to be here, even though virtually. And I thought I would um, start with a quote from William Bradford. And let me just pull this up on the screen because I think I can have access now. Here it is. Let me just start with a quote from William Bradford, which in many ways resonates with our current COVID crisis and also I think nicely sets up this um, question of the Puritans on innovation. So let me just bring you to the second slide, which is Proverbs 22, three, which he quotes, that a wise man seeth the plague when it cometh and hideth himself. Now, what's fascinating about this quote is that it really captures how the idea of flight from danger a narration of migration, which was largely in reaction to danger, has shaped our views of the Plymouth colony. So why voluntarily risk such a voyage across the Atlantic? Why expose themselves to perpetual peril and danger in the new world? Well, because they were trying to uh, seek asylum. They were seeking freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. They were trying to flee from the threat of war, which was looming large as the truce between the Netherlands and Spain was due to expire. And finally, they were seeking to protect themselves and also their children from the danger of this influence of the Dutch golden age with all of its wealth and worldly temptations. So why not mimic the Spanish empire and create a rival Protestant one of their own? Now this idea then of flight from danger, of migration as reaction, um, as trying to find a solution to their problems is very much um, compelling as a way to think about the impulse behind the Mayflower voyage. But what I wanted to argue and suggest today is that this impression is also incomplete and can also be misleading. And I think we only have to turn to some of their other contexts and works in order to see how strategic they were, how proactive, and also how they were in many ways starting to set out a new orientation to the idea of change itself, to the idea of novelty and to the discovery of the unknown. So there are hints of this when we think about Bradford and his description of one of the main leaders of the core migrants for the pilgrims um, in that church at Leiden. John Robinson, and he credits Robinson with having this strategic foresight and with his leadership in setting out this bold vision for the new world. And I'd like to focus here specifically on Robinson and how he does offer a, a way of rethinking how people were um, thinking about change at the time, not only in these formative years in Leiden, but also beyond. So let's begin then by rethinking their reactive versus proactive impulses. Most of, these most of these narratives about reactive change were written to a very specific audience and they were written for a very specific purpose. And I just wanted to outline two of those contexts here, which really go back before the migration, decades before the migration, even before the migration to the Netherlands all the way back to the end of the 16th century during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. Now, one of the main ways that contemporaries discredited people like the Mayflower migrants and their religious society was to charge them with novelty to which they were said to be addicted. 
Now, why was this such a scandal? Why was novelty such a dirty word during this period? Well, to be novel and to admit to novelty was to forfeit any claim to historic truth. It was to abandon the apostolic church. So the stigma of separation is really um, so serious that it's seen as worse than remaining within the church, even if that church holds some erroneous views. Um, it's a scandal to rent the body of Christ into pieces, and it's unlawful to seize authority, which Christ had divinely instituted and prescribed in a particular way. So there's also a legal problem because under Tudor treason law, outspoken religious dissent could be found um, as guilty of political treason because the crown claimed supremacy over the established church. Now, apart from execution, uh, that left two other options. And to put it crudely, they could either shut up or they could pack up and leave. Now, why the severity? Well, when we think about the world that they inhabited, wherein most of Catholic Europe are waging war against a Protestant queen, then it starts to make sense. We, we see this hydra-like conspiracy that um, is many headed and is seeking to replace Queen Elizabeth I on the throne with the Catholic Mary Queen of Scots. The Pope excommunicates Elizabeth and even commands English subjects to not dare obey her orders. So we can begin to see and appreciate why um, religious dissent and political treason are so closely bound up together. But why would a Protestant queen outlaw zealous Protestants? Why, allow, why not allow them to simply worship the way they wanted? Well, the problem was that some Puritans who became separatists were not merely making suggestions for minor improvements to the Church of England they were going one step further and renouncing it altogether as a false church. And that implied that the crown subjects must depart from that false church, which would undermine the crown's supremacy over the church. Now, to make matters worse, they were openly publicizing all of this, trolling bishops and coming up with their new ways to exploit social media to discredit the established church. And some of my favorites um, are the memes that are created later in the 17th century where they create these images of bishops as these you know, horned beasts. And so we really do see a lot of this being um, a public discussion and criticism of the church. So what did those who decided to leave and um, have to say in defense to such charges of novelty schism and political sedition? Well, the standard response was to simply deny any novelty or innovation. They claimed that it was the Church of England and not they who had departed from the apostolic church. But what's so fascinating is that this is not the only line of defense that gets developed over time. And there's a really interesting quote by Robinson when he offers this defense for the freedom to publicly disagree. As he put it, less hurt comes by silence than by speech, but so too doth less good. In other words, the potential for improvement outweighed the cost of giving offense by dissent and disagreement. The commitment to improvement is really crucial here and the one that I'd like to draw attention to. Because for Robinson, the insistence on silence for the sake of peace could become a tool of coercion that would inhibit progress and stunt the growth of society. And Ethan Shagan at Berkeley has uh, written a book called The Rule of Moderation in which he argues that the language of moderation and peace was often used when the government was at its most coercive. This is exactly the argument that Robinson is making when he argues that um, ministers who are silenced because of their dissent, however scathing their criticism of the religious status quo, uh, are being used with this bat to beat them um, in the name of peace. And as he puts it, all tyranny and confusion do present themselves under this color, taking up a pretense of peace as a weapon of more advantage, wherein the stronger and greater party uses to beat the weaker 
In other words, he's questioning what progress can be made when those in power silence critics for the sake of peace. So they decided to pack up, but they carried on criticizing the king's religious policy and even printing political criticisms. So what we're seeing is an example of this Leiden congregation proactively seeking improvement through their vocal criticisms rather than merely seeking refuge and safety. Um, we've got this glimpse of their de desire for continued growth, which was not simply strategic or opportunistic, but attached to a new way of thinking about further reform and change. And this brings me to a second way of thinking about how radical Robinson's views were when it came to innovation and change. And it's what I'd like to call the permissibility of political innovation. So a key passage actually comes in one of the most frequently cited works written by Robinson in his own time and even in his later reception. In Robinson's justification for separation, he followed the standard Puritan line that the rules for how the church or the household of God should be governed should be ordered by the household guide by which he meant scripture. And this is, he's actually, this is in the words of a 16th century divine named William Folk. But the idea that scripture was to govern how uh, God should be worshiped was one in which uh, we see the pilgrims repeatedly committed to. Um, that meant that scripture and not any sovereign could dictate the rules for worship. As he put it, the, the church is a kingdom which cannot be shaken, wherein may be no innovation in office or form of administration from that which Christ hath left or any inconvenience whatsoever. Now, what's so fascinating is that in contrast to all of this, Robinson went on to espouse a very radical implication about the mutability and possibility of political innovation. As he put it, civil administrations and their forms of government may be and oftentimes are altered for the avoiding of inconveniences according to the circumstances of time, place, and persons. Now, this is fascinating because it's one thing to argue that monarchy is not divinely ordained as believed by King James I. It is another thing to entertain in print that monarchy can be replaced by an alternative form of government. This is decades before the British Isles um, descend into civil war and they actually have to think about an alternative form of government following the trial and execution of King Charles I. Now, what I wanted to point out is that Robinson is not the first to make this argument. I just recently finished uh, editing a manuscript called Reform Government for Oxford University Press, which makes precisely this argument in response to some of the late 16th century defenses for the crown's um, liberty to change certain ecclesiastical and civil laws. And I'll say a little bit later about who Robinson is citing to, to actually um, come to this idea of the relativity of civil constitutions. But what I wanted to really emphasize here is the important context for how the Mayflower voyagers are conceiving of innovation in civil society. In thinking about the experimentation with new forms, the intellectual rationale is there. Um, and this is really early on. So we're left with the question, were the pilgrims essentially political radicals who remained social conservatives? Well, the answer is far from straightforward. And what I'd like to conclude with is how their radical understanding of not only political change, but also ecclesiastical change could inspire a reconfiguration of social relations as well. Now, even when it came to divine institutions, there was room for some discovery and new society and um, this idea of improvement and change. This like, dynamic change can actually be found in um, the career of John Robinson himself, from a hard line separatist stance when he first arrived in the Netherlands to a modified view um, when he was in Leiden. And according to contemporaries, um, Robinson um, was largely influenced by a radical Puritan named Henry Jacob. And for 400 years, a whole cache of Jacob's manuscripts remain buried and unknown in Trinity College Dublin Library, which is one of the most beautiful and stunning libraries 
in the world. I still get shivers down my spine when I walk into the library in the long room. And here I am reading a manuscript which was cataloged as a separatist um, work because um, they are charging um, an individual here um, of separatism. But actually upon reading this manuscript, which what became apparent is that this is actually containing um, a whole written defense by Henry Jacob and um, a criticism of him for his new ideas about ecclesiastical change. It's here that we see the first, um, first use in the English speaking world of the name independency, several decades before it's supposed to publicly appear in print in the English Civil Wars. Now, they even coined this name to point out his novelty. And I'll just draw your attention here on the screen to how they say, this independency is like this disease that um, is covering up Jacob's eyes so that everywhere they see the word church in the New Testament, all they can see is, is a church independent. Now, what's really important about Jacob's independent views is that he is moving away from arguing exclusively for the necessity of setting up a new church. And he is arguing for the first time for the freedom to do so. And he uses the language um, of liberty that's akin to the uh, classical Roman Republican idea of freedom as enjoying a non-dependent status. This idea that you have free from any possibility of domination, not necessarily um, that you're simply free from the physical act of constraint. And the classic example that Quentin Skinner often uses is that of a slave who enjoys a degree of personal freedom under a benevolent master who is still nonetheless a slave because of his dependent status. So Jacob is actually um, making this argument for freedom and independence in the church. He sees each particular congregation as being free and independent. He extends this view to argue that individual believers have the freedom to create their new self-authenticating church society. So we have freedom of the church, individual congregations from any other authority. We have freedom to set up new churches. And we also have a new idea about what it means to have ecclesiastical change. Because in these manuscripts, Jacob um, sees that when push comes to shove, he argues that maybe Reformation in Europe hadn't gone far enough. Maybe reform had to go beyond what Martin Luther and John Calvin had envisioned. And this is really striking because in his printed works, he's at pains to ground his tradition in that of the tradition of the European Reformation. So he cites repeatedly um, continental European reformers, but here he's saying that it's permissible to go beyond what they have said. So he also doesn't have to denounce the Church of England as altogether false because what he's done is he's redefined it as not a single national church, but individual parishes, some of which he can selectively communicate with or to gather one himself. So there's a great deal of freedom being um, defended here. And this gave radicalism a more acceptable face because it was no longer schism, it was this freedom. Um, and it opened this idea to, uh, up to go more mainstream. Now, what I want to return to is Jacob's influence on Robinson in the 1610s, which gives us an opportunity to really think about how these ideas um, really shaped um, the contours of the Mayflower migration. So Robinson actually cites Jacob to justify the freedom to establish new church society. And he also cites Jacob in arguing for the relativity of political civil constitutions. But thirdly, Robinson also further developed this idea of freedom to chart new terrain. One of my favorite examples of this is Robinson's repeated warning that injury from falling forward, which can be cosmetic, is far less fatal than that from which, when, which you in, is incurred when you fall backwards. So what Robinson is essentially saying is that you're either moving forward or you're moving backward which is far more fatal, there is no um, stagnation. There's no staying still um, in spiritual life. As he puts it, when it comes to the life of faith, we must grow and increase in the whole body of obedience 
and all the parts thereof. Otherwise, as in the natural body, if one part grow and not another, the effect will be monstrous. So what we're seeing is a political and ecclesiastical radicalism. And I just wanted to conclude with this question of whether we see any so social implications for this as well. Now, the first picture that usually comes to mind is that of the oppressive Puritan regime against women in New England. And it's really difficult to get behind this literary caricature from the crucible or from the Scarlet Letter as David Hall has been um, speaking about and writing about. Well, anyone who studies the Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts is struck by its relatively conservative social character. And there are a number of factors that fed into this. Uh, Plymouth itself was keen to deny any charges of radical social anarchy. The Massachusetts Bay Colony likewise were eager to distance themselves even from Plymouth, um, even though in fact, they were actually much more indebted than sometimes uh, willing to admit. But the world of the pilgrims was actually more diverse than it might first seem. And there's a few quotes from Robinson. I'm not sure how much time I have to share all of them. I'll just share one in which Robinson argues that the use of discretion in different variable circumstances is a skill that enables a man to improve himself in all affairs. And what he goes on to do is to not only condemn spiritual complacency, but to condemn complacency in general knowledge, which he argues um, is just as monstrous or uh, not just as monstrous, but equally, what you need is moral and intellectual improvement, both going together. So there's potential for social improvement there in Robinson's views. Did they actually stretch social boundaries at the time? What I wanna do is look outside of the Plymouth colony. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing Rebecca Frazier's work on uh, women and families and their exper lived experiences. Um, but I want to actually move forward into the mid 17th century where we get a few examples of how Robinson's ideas about improvement and change did challenge tra traditional social relations. Now, two decades after the Mayflower voyage to the new world, these ideas were threatening to begin yet another back in the old. Critics in Britain claim that Robinson was responsible for spreading far more radical ideas than appeared in the new Plymouth colony. As the British Isles spiraled into civil war, radicals were seizing the opportunity to make new claims to liberty, um, which ended in the trial and execution of King Charles I. Now, this is where Robinson reappeared. His work was allegedly plagiarized by radicals in the Revolutionary Army who threatened to dismantle all social hierarchy. And Edmund Chillenden was one army agitator who appeared to silently lift Robinson's arguments to make the case for any man, however humble, to preach divine truth. It's no surprise that Chillenden was a member of one of these offshoot London churches that were first planted by Henry Jacob. Now, one of the main points I've been arguing about Jacob's brand of independence is that it did more than simply rehearse or revive an ancient Roman Republican idea about freedom consisting in this non-dependent status. He explicitly identified independence as freedom in the New Testament, which stretched it beyond the political idea, which was reserved for an elite group of men who had veer, were manly, who had virtue, virtue um, and actually applied it universally to every believer. This meant that it could appeal to men lower down the social order, as we've seen in the army, and it might even extend to women. So, Robinson himself was, of course, careful to qualify the most egalitarian implications in his ideas. And I've already explained why the Plymouth Plantation and the New England colonies wanted to distance themselves from this idea that it would result in all sorts of social anarchy to claim this kind of uh, freedom for churches. But the Jacob connection, again, tells a different story. Another member of the Jacob offshoot churches in London used Robinson to begin this new world in the old. Catherine Chidley was one of the earliest and most vocal female writers and political activists in the English Revolution. And she led an army of women in London to petition parliament. She vigorously defended Robinson's views as England was collapsing into civil war in her justification for independence. So basically nothing is seen as extraordinary here. She believes in freedom and the natural ability of women to speak in public, which marks this transition to being a more normative thing rather than something that's reserved for exceptional prophetesses. So basically what I'm arguing here is that despite this emphasis on reaction, what we see is this proactive vision. Although the pilgrims denied they were political observe, 
um, subversives. They entertain radical ideas about alternative forms of government. Um, even though they stress moral imperatives for setting up new churches, they also argued for the freedom to do so. Um, and so what we see then is that it's this unique convergence of religious, political, and social worlds that produced something that was itself new. And they offered a much more robust defense for the idea of dynamic change itself, believing that public discourse and disagreement could lead to new solutions to problems and further improvement. All this was quite innovative in their own time and also highly relevant to us in thinking about uncertain circumstances that we are living through in our own. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Polly. Um, this is fantastic. And I was wrong to say that you were merely a historian of religious thought because evidently it is all interconnected um, uh, as your talk very clearly showed. Um, our next speaker, just to remind you, is Rebecca Fraser talking about 17th century women and the Mayflower um, and on to Rebecca. Hello. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak about 17th century women in the Mayflower on this great 400th anniversary. And um, I am going to talk about the innovative side of Plymouth. Um, and one of the Mayflower's most celebrated documents is the revolutionary compact signed on the ship, um, which is often seen as a forerunner of the Declaration of Independence because with this agreement, the settlers established a colony based on the consent of the government, which was totally sort of extraordinary in Western European thought. Um, and of course, a lot of the governed were female. And people always ask, did any women sign it? After all, women are shown in all the pictorial representations of it. Um, and they may be poring over the paper or in the background with their children, but they are there. And of course, most people would guess correctly that it would have been highly unusual if any women had signed such a document. Um, and although drawing up the compact was a revolutionary event, it was not so revolutionary that women were involved. Um, women had very few legal rights in England at that period, especially married women, uh, of which there were many. And until the mid 19th century, it was the law that after marriage, a woman legally became part of her husband's body. So she had no separate existence, theoretically at least. But nevertheless, those images do have a historic and poetic truth. The Mayflower community settled Plymouth in a unique way. Women there had far more rights, not only than women in old England, but in a more prestigious position than in their sister colony, Massachusetts. In fact, there were even rumors in London in the 1620s that women and children were allowed to vote in the colony when it first began. And Professor Frank Bremer has suggested that it means it was known that women had a role in church events in Plymouth, which was why people wondered whether women had a vote in civil matters. So though this was hastily denied, actually women had a great deal of influence on what we today might call soft power in Plymouth. 30 years after the Mayflower landed, married women could make contracts, were allowed to run taverns, they had to be in court to agree to land sales, and they had to agree in court to any issue regarding their children. Now you don't get this in old England until over 200 years later. In Plymouth, if the money left to a widow was inadequate, courts could give her a better deal. You could say this was the effect of the American frontier, but it didn't happen in Massachusetts, just Plymouth. Like most researchers, I started thinking about Mayflower women in, in dramatic images, the little ship, the stormy seas, the new win England winter they landed in because their plans went awry, and they were 18, not terribly fit women older women who had long skirts which were permanently damp, they couldn't wear practical clothes, sports clothing, three of them were pregnant and they had children to run after who had no toys really. And my first thought was how brave they were and then when I considered the history of the colony it made me think they were not only brave but very unusual. So we have to ask ourselves what made Plymouth different and I think it was a combination of things. I think that um, the Mayflower women had very strong personality, 
Um, but I think that the key factor was probably 80% of the Mayflower travelers, both men and women had connections to these separatist congregational churches that Polly has been talking about both in London and Holland. And this had a huge influence on the way women were treated, but also on the habits of mind of the women themselves. Congregational churches did not like hierarchies, whatever they said. And historians believe that had an empowering effect on women. And they strongly believed in a participatory, a democratic form of church government and independent minds. And then there's another key factor, a super key factor. And luckily we've, we've had from Polly a discussion of his, his, his influence and his theoretical ideas. And that was the Leiden Church's extraordinary pastor, John Robinson. So the first thing I asked myself when writing about the Mayflower women was, did they have much choice? Was this voyage in, in, in autumn a classic example of what we today might describe as patriarchal oppression? And three of the Mayflower ladies were at least six months pregnant when they took off for America. From, from a 21st century perspective, I was amazed that two gave birth, one in mid-ocean and one at the end of the voyage. The ship they took was terribly small, not ocean going, and they were traveling into the unknown. They didn't even have proper maps and only one of the sailors had crossed the Atlantic before. So they were headed for Virginia. They actually made landfall 600 miles further north where there were no English settlements at all. And it was a, a, a little ship. It wasn't much bigger than the ships that put, took the first settlers to Virginia. And it was in such poor shape. It was sold for scrap a couple of years after its voyage. And, and they were not very well prepared. You know, they, there are later notes saying that they should have taken the advice of sailors about how to store meal and they should have brought lemons against what will be identified in the 18th century as the disease called scurvy and they should have taken paper and linseed oil to make windows before glass could be manufactured otherwise their houses were so dark um, and they needed huge amounts of bedding because the wet got in everywhere um, and I think that the women who went on the Mayflower took the decision to board the ship themselves because the congregational nature of the Mayflower church meant people were allowed to express their views, whether they were male or female. And actually, English women of the period don't seem to have been very biddable to start with. The Puritan London clergyman, William Googe, said very crossly that when he was preaching on feminine subservience, which was supposed to be the rule, it frequently provoked a rustle of discontent amongst the women in his congregation. And in the case of the Leiden Church and the Mayflower, women were encouraged to think by John Robinson, who was the former Church of England clergyman exiled to Holland by his nonconformist view. And Robinson, really valued the female intellect and he thought their role in Christian churches needed expanding. And he passionately believed he, God had created men and women of what he called an equal perfection. And he found evidence that important women in the New Testament who were disciples like Phoebe and Tabitha had actually been deaconesses. And he also wrote that women should speak without restraint in church meetings if divinely inspired. Um, and if there was a problem in the church, a man wouldn't tackle, a woman was permitted to reprove the church rather than permit it to go on in apparent wickedness. Now, this was extraordinary stuff. And um, Robinson also hoped there would be an American Indian church, and he severely reprimanded the pilgrims when they attacked a local tribe. But these were not the usual thought patterns of the 17th century. So what was the customary view of women then? Well, I'm afraid to say, as you, many of you will know, officially 17th century European thought held that not only were women the weaker sex physically, but they were weaker morally. And you have to remember the culture was heavily based on the Bible. So Eve was the first to sin, Eve was tempted up by the devil, and as one wit has said, Eve was framed. But since Eve was responsible for Adam's fall, a huge number of consequences flowed, flowed from that. Um, the idea that Eve was cursed. And I hope nowadays most people would laugh at this, but those ideas were really completely accepted in the 17th century. So we have to start from the premise that Mayflower settlers were very unusual for their day. And um, 
that women were a powerful presence in the church community. Um, and luckily, we, we have a pretty good sense of what it was like to live there. Um, John Robinson had three powerful sisters-in-law, the Whites, who had all followed him from Nottinghamshire to Holland, and, and maybe affection for them influenced Robinson. The sisters and their husbands lived in what was a family compound, and one of those husbands was the legendary governor, John Carver. And most of the congregation had really impoverished themselves because of their religious views. And so there was, a real, uh, there was also a real problem about housing, even if you were well off. Um, because as Polly said, Holland was in the middle of a war with Spain. So the city was overflowing with refugees. And Robinson and his wife had an enormous garden and they allowed 20 church families to build wooden um, cottages in that garden. And, and years later, Pilgrim Edward Winslow remembered the extraordinarily happy atmosphere, a sort of family feeling and a combination of shared beliefs. But though family feeling kept them going, it made it very hard for the advance guard of the people on the Mayflower to say goodbye. And on both sides, tears were shed and Robinson sent lots of letters to advice to, to people he considered his flock. And of course, John Carver was his brother-in-law. So he had a sort of extra reason to sort of really care about, about um, what was gonna happen. And, but of course, he didn't think this was going to be a final farewell. No one in the church thought that. Um, it, they were just meant to be the advance guard and then the rest of the church was going to get to America one, once houses were built and the colony was better established. Um, so I think there's a real family feeling on the Mayflower journey, um, which was so dangerous. And I think there was a camaraderie on the boat because of their sufferings, whether in England or Holland. And um, I think really in this year's phrase, they were truly all in it together. Um, so to these committed religious people, uh, male or female, uh, creating a godly new world was worth braving anything for. And actually, as a footnote regarding those brave pregnant ladies, childbirth was so dangerous in those days, regardless of who you were or, or where you were, that in terms of sanitary condition, a ship was no worse really than a, ha a room in a farmhouse <clears throat> or a weaver's house in Holland. At least there would be plenty of water. But and in any case, more than 30 people had died of the church community in Leiden because of the terrible living conditions. Even if they were in the Robinson's garden, the pilgrims were living ten to a room, which is where they cooked and worked. They took in piecework and little children were employed in the lucrative ribbon industry because it depended on tiny fingers. Um, and they were being sent money to survive from England. So they were really running out of options. And, and um, their children, there's a terrible quote, their children seem to be growing old before their time. They were decrepit in their early youth. So who were these Mayflower women? And in keeping with contemporary attitudes, Governor William Bradford is magnificent in every way, doesn't really mention them very much, but luckily in the past 400 years, an awful lot of de detective work has been done. And particularly by the very famous Mayflower expert, Caleb Johnson, who is going to be addressing us. Amongst so, so much else, he discovered that three Mayflower women, Mrs. Brewster, Susanna White Winslow, and Dorothy May Bradford were very closely connected to each other through the Scrooby Church. Um, but the Mayflower women came from lots of different backgrounds. I believe that some female members of the congregation came on their own account, attracted to the church's novel emphasis on women. And, and they were strong-minded people in their own right, like Mrs. Chilton, um, who was the, the mother of the 13-year-old Mary Chilton, who is supposed to have been the first person to step on Plymouth Rock. And most unusually for a woman, Mrs. Chilton had been expelled from her local church, her local Eng Church of England church, um, for attending the secret burial of a child not according to the rites of the Church of England, um, because it was too papist and her husband was not expelled. So it was probably Mrs. Chilton herself who decided they should all go and join the Pilgrim's Church in Leiden. Um, and in fact, sadly, her elderly husband would be one of the first people to die on arrival 
in America, and she too died sometime the first winter. But her orphan 13 year old daughter Mary survived. And the others, others were amongst others, there was Elizabeth Barker Winslow and her niece, Janie Hazel, who were serious minded single women. And there was also Mrs. Sarah Minter, um, who was a midwife for the church. Um, and she stayed behind in Leiden, but her little daughter sailed. But in some ways, the most influential was Mrs. Mary Brewster, the wife of the um, Cambridge educated lay leader of the church, William Brewster. And she lived in a huge manor house before she escaped to Holland. Um, and in Holland, she was lo lodging in what was accurately called the Stink Alley. Um, she was, but she was very much part of the first church's secret gatherings at Scrooby. And in fact, Eve or no Eve, women had been members of informal congregational gatherings since the time of John Wycliffe. Um, but now, um, in the Pilgrim's time, you get an Elizabethan church settlement, which is not Protestant enough, and you get this huge reaction. You get men and women gathering, discussing the Bible in little, um, little sort of groups, secret groups, and they would have talked about church rituals, how making the sign of the cross, wearing vestments and so on, was definitely not part of Christ's ancient church. And in fact, there were quite a number of Puritan patronesses like Lady Isabel Bowes and Mrs. Rose Hickman, who was actually a relation of John Locke, and they allowed gatherings in their large houses and they were important figures. And Mrs. Brewster was in that tradition. Her, her husband was an important government official with a large house. And in fact, separatist women, if they could be got, were, were considered sufficiently dangerous to be in, imprisoned, like Joan Helwys, the wife of the founder of the Baptist movement. And, and she was part of the Brewster's circle. And the Brewster's first child was called Jonathan, and the next were called Puritan names. They were called uh, fear, as in fear of God, and wrestling, wrestling with God. And that suggests that the couple underwent a Puritan conversion in the late 1590s. Um, the Reformation changed the demographics of reading, who read, why they read, and just as importantly, what they thought. And the influential Puritan John Dodd denounced those who tied women to the wheel and the spindle. Puritan women um, were brought up to read, not necessarily to write, but to read. And many women in Plymouth Colony owned their own Bibles. Um, luggage was very, very limited on the Mayflower. Um, so anything you hear about sort of huge tables carried over or beds, it, it's very unlikely. It, 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 there was just so little space. But I think that, that Bibles would, would have been smuggled over. So where we might read a book or watch TV, in the 16th and 17th century, Puritans family, Puritan families had daily discussions of biblical texts or sermons, and that was very important in family life. And Puritan women discussed ideas and sometimes led family prayers. And it was, that was very empowering for women. Um, and of course, a, dec a decade after the Mayflower landed, when um, Mrs. Anne Hutchinson's views highly offended the male theocracy at Boston, learnedness among women in New England did become suspect for a while. But on the whole, Puritans, whether American or English, liked women to be learned. And because lay leadership was so tremendously important in congregational churches, the family unit became crucial when the formal Church of England was refusing all change. So women were just involved anyway. And, and I like to think that some bright young Mayflower woman, women got out of preparing food with the New Testament story of Martha and Mary. As you will remember, Mary's meditative role is called the better part. Because the volume of physical labor Mayflower women had to get through was a big barrier to the life of the mind. If you think lockdown has played havoc with the lives of professionals who have washing machines and fridges, the physical grind of cleaning, washing and cooking that women did in the 17th century uh, left very little time in the day for anything else. And those Mayflower women who survived the voyage um, whose husbands died in the great epidemic that killed 50% of the settlers on landing, remarried pretty immediately. The widowed Susanna White married Edward Winslow, 
two months after her husband died for protection, but also to look after his domestic needs to be a housekeeper. And everything suggests that in the Lion Church, women members had a unique relationship with Robinson. And, and once uh, they landed, um, he was really expected on every tide and every ship people would run to the shore hoping will be he would be there and although all church members grieved that Robinson was prevented from coming to America and then sadly died um, I think uh, um, I think he would have brought a, a different note to the development of churches all over England so it was a very great loss but there were other losses. Sailing at the Mayflower came at huge cost to women. 13 of the 18 adult women far, died far more than men. This is probably because they stayed on board ship once it landed, looking after their children, instead of getting into the open air and exploring. And only five adult women survived the first winter and lived to see what is generally known as the first Thanksgiving in the autumn of 1621. So you have the um, Rose Standish, the wife of the famous professional soldier for the expedition, Miles Standish, Mary Allerton, Mary Martin, um, Mrs. Mullins, the, the mother of Priscilla, and, and they were just unable to resist a pandemic which was brought on by their weakened state and the insanitary conditions on board, and they all died two or three months after the Mayflower landed. So the only grown-up women, women surviving were um, Mary Brewster, Susanna White, Elizabeth Hopkins, and Eleanor Billington. And there was not only disease to co contend with, there was emotional loss and anxiety about a new land. Soon after they arrived, William Bradford's wife, Dorothy, passed away. And her body was, was discovered uh, floating in Provincetown Harbour. And, and this is a, a disputed area. It does seem fairly likely she had killed herself. And she'd left her three-year-old son behind in Holland, and perhaps she just felt unbearably lonely. And even Mrs. Brewster is reported to have been pining until her daughters arrived on another ship. And her husband said he was very worried what he called her weak and decayed state of body. And in a letter, John Robinson hopes that the safe arrival of them um, would see a revival in his old friend. Well, we know from the artifacts the pilgrims left behind, which are now in Pilgrim Hall Museum, that many came from genteel circles. The Brewster family had produced members of parliament for 200 years. They'd brought writing chests with them, blue dove pottery, embroidered napkins, and they traveled with etiquette books, um, like a fashionable poet's witty verses about the best feminine qualities. And the English translation of a bestseller which addressed the reformation of Italian manners. But there just wasn't gonna be time for discussions about manners in the months ahead. And life literally was about survival. Um, but they got very caustic letters arriving from their financial backers in London, um, who sort of said sarcastically that they were spending too much time having philosophical and religious discussions and not sending enough commodities back uh, to make the colony worthwhile. But all, and almost um, ha all, half the tough young men, the indentured servants who were supposed to build houses died. So women as well as men had to raise the roof frames. And um, John Carver and, and his wife, Catherine, John Ro Robinson's sister-in-law, probably were killed by the strain. Uh, they were from the merchant class. They were not used to some physical work. Yet, 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 of those who survived, other than two younger girls, the women of the Mayflower never wanted to return to England. And, and Susanna White Winslow received letters from friends worried about her dangerous life in the New England wilderness. But she seems to have been really content, even though her husband was frequently absent and she had a tiny baby born on the Mayflower to look after as well as a two-year-old. But I think it reminds one of their tough-mindedness that female colonists were instrumental in forcing the authorities to end the communal system on which their backers insisted. Um, the women protested that washing the clothes and cooking for the single young men was a kind of slavery. And once they had their own fields, they were happy to work in them and set the call, having previously said they were too weak. Um, and Bradford noted that to have compelled them would have been thought 
great tyranny and oppression. And more women come, started coming out, like Mistress Elizabeth Warren, the formidable wife of Mayflower passenger Richard Warren with her five daughters. She was such a powerful personality and so wealthy, she even became a purchaser of the colony, someone who guaranteed its debts. And this majestic figure not only took her servant to court for profanity, she defeated her son-in-law in a legal battle, and she probably has the most Mayflower descendants. Like many of the later settlers, she died at the grand old age of 90. In a moving phrase, the colony recorded that the aged widow, having lived a godly life, came to her grave as a shock of corn fully ripe. She was honorably buried. The Mayflower women had to be buried at dead of night because the settlers were worried the Wampanoag would see how pitifully small their numbers had become. But those interments were no less honorable in the eyes of the community, short as those courageous lives had been. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rekha, um, that was, for that wonderful talk and uh, letting the ladies finally have um, center stage. Um, I've been asked to, please excuse the lens flare, the very dramatic hipster lens flare I've got going on here. Um, I uh, have been asked to remind all of our viewers um, that you can submit and please do submit questions in the comment section on YouTube or email uh, at constitution at uvu.edu. Um, but for the moment, we do in fact have some questions coming in. Um, so the first question that's come in, I think is, well, I'd like, I think both Rebecca and Polly could probably address this. Um, how different do you suppose the Mayflower Compact itself would be if women had never boarded the Mayflower? Can their influence be seen in any way? So who wants to go first on that one? Well, I, I think it's very interesting that the, um, the Mayflower Compact was signed by all the sort of adult men, but it also included two of the indentured servants on board, on board. And I think that there was a genuinely, I think congregationalism was a genuinely, what a sort of prototype of, it was a democratic movement. And I think that, that, you know, I'm not sure women had that much influence on the compact per se, but, but I think there was an inclusiveness there. And, and you also have to remember that, again, the people who, who signed the compact wouldn't have been allowed to vote in England till the 19th century. You know, it, again, it's a sort of very unusual, it's a sort of social revolution. Um, I really liked Rebecca's point about the freedom of choice, because that is exactly what we see many of these women in um, these gathered churches exercising, sometimes against the wishes of their own husbands. And in one case, um, we have a minister who has to defend the choice of his wife to join his congregation against the wishes of her husband. So there definitely is this idea that women are participating through not only their active consent, um, but also through their testimony for other, you know, you know, sort of new members, through their decision to join a society, and they also argue for the freedom to exit a society. So it is an embryonic form in those individual congregations, as Rebecca was mentioning. Absolutely. Well, th thank you. That's, th those are both really good responses. I suppose, as a historian, my thought would be, we can't see all the power relations in the society just from the documents that are preserved, particularly from an era as distant and distant and a moment as as fraud as as that one was. So I suppose it's one way of looking at power relations, but it, it can't capture everything. Um, our, our next question. Did Jacobs claim that independence and freedom to establish societies mean that Plymouth was more religiously tolerant than neighboring colonies? I think there is certainly a lot of religious toleration that they in theory were very much committed to, which might be constrained in certain circumstances. But I love this one quote um, from the Lighting Congregation where they say they would rather live next to infidels and heathens and be free to worship the way that they would like. 
than live in a Christian nation where they are compelled against their conscience. And this is before the migration where they are very much committed to this idea of freedom of conscience. And that's certainly something that Jacob himself argues for. And we have a document where he, he writes for this freedom of uh, religion and conscience. And you have King James's angry annotations scribbled into the margins um, in which he disagrees. So we certainly see that commitment to religious freedom and conscience there in Plymouth, as well as in England, as well as in Leiden. Rebecca? Oh, well, well I, I absolutely, whatever uh, Polly says, yeah, I, I, um, uh, <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think that I sort of, I, I think Robinson was sort of fantastically um, open-minded and, and wanted further light. You know, he had, he wanted an, a, a new light to come from the new world. And, and that included new churches. He was sort of, he believed you, you, the reformation must move on, that there was going to be revelation, different revelation. And he was welcoming that. And I think that did make them more tolerant. And in fact, the history of, of Plymouth is very tolerant. You know, they, they allowed, they didn't execute Quakers, unlike Massachusetts. Um, they allowed them to live quietly. They were very independent minded. And even in King Philip's war, there was a lot of anger about the Native Americans being sent as slaves before they were even tried um, by sadly, Josiah Winslow. So, so I think that they were truly independently minded. I, I think to be a separate, well, whatever you like to call it, but to be a, a, a member of an independent church or congregational church, you have to be, a, at that time, you have to be a very brave, committed person, and they were. Fantastic. We finally have a question from the classroom. Um, Miss Holman from Cedar Valley AP government wants to ask, why did the creators of the Mayflower Compact still want to be connected to England and not just form their own country right out? Why didn't we just have the American Revolution when they arrived? I think that Jacob probably helps us. Well, let me just throw in a Jacob response to this first. I think this very crucial move that Robinson himself largely adopts when he's in Leiden, this idea that you don't have to separate and completely cut off all ties is a really important one that we can be self-governing and yet still remain loyal subjects. And the denial that they are political revolutionaries is, is a really important idea for them that they do truly believe that they are being faithful subjects and loyal subjects while also um, ordering their own church society. Yeah, I, I think this is a moment of maximum patriotism. It's really a sort of hangover from Elizabeth's reign. But there's, you know, there's this sort of patriotic duty um, to create Protestant colonies, English Protestant colonies. So I think it would have been difficult to turn their back on that kind of um, heritage. Um, and I think they, there's some, um, I think it's, it's Robert Cushman's famous sermon in which he he talks about how awful it is to feel to feel sort of they're despised by everybody. So I think they didn't want to be despised. They they wanted to be part of England, but do things in their own way. And um, I mean, I think it's true that because they was New England really, in a way, is sort of mentally very separate from England from a very sort of so quickly um, because of. Um, so many things and also of course because they hide regicides after the revolution um or the restoration so i think you know there is a natural kind of um independence sort of but but i mean at the same time i think the early comers particularly the mayflower are, are very sort of dedicated to being i mean they call themselves king james's subjects they describe the king king james to Samikin in a sort of very excited way. So I don't think they're sort of their radicals sort of in that kind of way. Yeah, no, I, I think that 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 certainly makes sense to me from the point from the perspective of the revolution when they were certainly trying to show the English how to be better at being English um, in that moment. Um, so we have a question about women. How much did the women of Plymouth who were afforded more social freedoms than women in other colonies influence the treatment of women in other colonies? So was there any, what were, were, were women in Plymouth sort of leading the way for, for, for the treatment of women in other colonies? 
Um, I think to some extent you have to deduce because Plymouth Colony was a very poor little colony and it's sort of thunder is really stolen by Boston. Um, but I'm not sure that women in, in Plymouth would have gone along with the way Anne Hutchinson was treated. I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure they would have found this her, her trial nothing but sort of horrible actually the way she you know her all the sort of um assumptions about women were profoundly misogynistic and I think they were sort of rubbed away by John Robinson but suddenly they are writ large in in Anne Hutchinson's trial and I I'm not sure they would have done there would have been muttering I think and I, I you know there are no famous women in Plymouth um, but I still think there would have been a weight of secret or, or maybe not so secret disapproval. Mm -hmm. I think so, terrific and, and um, now we have a question for uh, Polly um, which is about the ramification what ramifications could be seen in English society from the writings of John Robinson and Henry Jacob in general. I think that really connects to um, what Rebecca was mentioning about the ideals being there that sometimes aren't necessarily fully expressed. And I think with the disruptions of the English civil wars in the mid 17th century, we see that disruption where censorship is no longer inhibiting women from printing. What, what we see from that sudden burst of women into print is that this is something that they've been practicing on the local level all along and citing Robinson and citing Jacob. Um, Catherine Chidley is actually very friendly with a, a woman named Sarah Jones, who was a member of Jacob's original congregation, who is very vocal in her individual congregation and believes women have the freedom to speak publicly on political issues. Both of them believe that they are, you know, th th they can speak publicly. And that is something that appears in print because censorship breaks down, but was there in practice in local communities, which is very diverse. It's, it's not that you get a single consistent experience across these churches even during the English Civil Wars. But what we do see are some seeds for this active participant, um, participation by women, which um, says that it's no longer an exceptional gift as a prophetess, but this is a normative um, faculty that's been endowed by Christ to women to be able to reason and make decisions on spiritual matters. And so they argue, if this is being given to women on spiritual matters, which are the weightier, then how much more should they apply to political matters, which are the lesser? And so there is a connection between that spiritual um, 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 exercise of consent that Chidley strongly believes in, and then her level of her level or experience as a petition to parliament, leading these women to petition parliament. So there's a connection that she draws and other independents draw. So yes, that, that's so. So those are some of the some of the ramifications we see in English society um, from uh, those writings of people who influenced the Mayflower, exactly. uh, the Plymouth Colony. Um, I have a question, um, which is about we haven't really talked much about North America. Um, perhaps, obviously, we've sort of been we've a lot of a lot of our discussions been in England and uh, and in the Netherlands. What was well, so? My question is, what was their vision of America before they went? And I'm particularly interested in that family. You know, what was, what were they thinking it would be like to raise a family in the New World? Well, so, actually, um, you were asking about patriotism. I, one of the things that worried them, the, uh, the pilgrims, was that they were losing their English identity, that they were becoming Dutch. And so th there is this sort of, there is this nationalistic I idea that they are going to be sort of English. They are going to be English people, not overwhelmed by Dutch, Dutch customs, because they regarded the Dutch as sort of frivolous. Um, and not serious enough. So I, I think they, I think in, in some ways, everything about the Mayflower actually was done in a way in a, in a rush, you know, they, I think perhaps they had sort of, they were excited. Um, actually, American Indian tribes were really a, a subject of enormous interest 
um, they were sort of speculated about, were they the lost tribes of Israel? Where did they come from? Had they sort of, you know, survived the flood and so on and so forth. So, so it was huge cultural interest. And, and, and actually in the case of Edward Winslow, who writes about um, the American Indian tribes, the, there was a real fascination there. And don't forget the Pocahontas had, had come to London just before the, the Mayflower set off. And I, and I think they were really interested in the first years of, of Plymouth, about 10 years, really till Massachusetts gets going. You have a very symbiotic way of life. And I think they're fascinated by, by the American Indians. And, and I think, you know, they, they have romantic ideas about them. Yeah. I think that they, it's significant that they deliberately chose um, the idea of cultivation as opposed to somewhere where it would be easy to harvest um, because they believed that then others it would attract com um, competitive confessional rivals. And so they, when thinking about where to settle, they thought, let's go somewhere which isn't necessarily going to be somewhere that's going to attract the Spanish. And that idea of cultivation was certainly part of that rhetoric, which existed in the Spanish Empire as well. But I think it is very interesting that they use that language. So uh, we have one minute and one question, which is how did the women of Plymouth, of the Mayflower and Plymouth, join and exit a society? I'm not sure. I think that the- In terms of religious society or- continue, I think sorry. largely when it comes to church society, um, it's the, the testimony of other members that they are um, of good conversation and, you know, um, and good confession and that you would normally have a testimony and then you would need to be transferred. You couldn't just simply go off rogue and leave a community and go to another. You needed a testimony to, for people to vouch for you. Terrific. Well, thank you so much. And now it's time uh, for a break, a little Zoom break for everybody. Um, but uh, thank you so much to our speakers, Rebecca Fraser and Polly Hart. Thank you, Scott. Um, this was for this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Grace, for moderating on, on behalf of the center. And thank you as well to Polly and to Rebecca. This has been a fantastic beginning to our conference.